Case Buck Bees and S Group, good afternoon. I know it's an odd time today, but there's never a good time, is there? And today we're talking about Cape independence. Um, for those Cape Tonians on the line, the bubble has burst. You've lived in a bubble for a long time. It is paradise. It is the place to live on the planet. And I've lived a lot of places overseas, but you can't live in the bubble that you've lived in that I've discovered when I arrived going to dinner parties in Bishop's Court. I mean, it's, you've got to wake up Cape Tonians because it is too late. The troubles have reached our shores. Sorry to tell you. It's a very Jobo boy to come down and tell you, irritates you, but it's true. And today we've got our, on our webinar, Joe Boiter and Phil Craig, um, much easier names than Rob Herser. Joe Boiter, uh, based in Cape Town. Joe, give us the 30 seconds on Joe Boiter. Hi, um, thanks for hosting us. Um, tech entrepreneur, uh, built a couple of telecoms businesses, um, very passionate about uh, sort of kind of called it entrepreneurship, uh, capitalism, free markets. And uh, yeah, joined the Cape Independence Group earlier this year and been looking after the sort of like tech projects and helping them fundraise. And Joe, where were you born? I was born in Pretoria. Okay, another northern boy. Phil, um, you're not in Wellington, England. You're in the rainy bit up country, aren't you? Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ne neither of you are northern. <laughs> Where are you born? <laughs> so I, I, I was born. I was born in Middlesbrough, in the north of England, <laughs> much oh, further north than here. <laughs> but but I've I've been uh, been in Wellington in the Western Cape now for uh, for sixteen years, and I, I I married local, so so I'm here now, <laughs> and, and yeah, loving yeah. it too. Yeah, you're probably more local than Joe and I. I uh, I was born in Johannesburg in 1960. I'm not 60 yet. In 1960, and I came. I Left the, did you, came to UCT, military service, did 31 years abroad and came back three years ago, having found fame and fortune overseas and came back and my Kiwi wife just said, forget about Johannesburg, we're going to Cape Town. So I am stuck in paradise, but I'm very worried about paradise. I'm, I'm worried that the game is very close to being over. And when I got introduced to Joe and told about Cape independence, and he explained to me that we are focused on a referendum. I thought this sounds intelligent. So, Joe, why don't you start off and tell us what is Cape Independence? What is the mantra? Where are we going? Okay, so yes, we're a, we're a lobby group, um, which is quite different to sort of political parties out there. We're quite focused on our mission, as you said. We are trying to convince people to call for a referendum, particularly the leadership of the DA. And the reason we're doing that is we believe um, the best thing for the citizens of the Western Cape is to secede and to form a new country and uh, basically give the citizens of the Western Cape their sort of democratic will. Um, yeah, that's about it. And why, what, what is the key to our democratic will? Since 1994, we've only voted in the DA and yet the DA is never going to be representative in our government in any meaningful way. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so in an ideal world, the Western Cape would have had so, a lot more autonomy. Uh, some kind of federal autonomous system would have been a, a nice daydream. But this is not reality we face, us face now. So a lot of things are controlled from um, sort of Joburg, Pretoria, uh, centralized government, a lot of uh, um, trends which which is our, which the Western Cape have rejected for many years uh, just seem to kind of keep on rolling in, sort of socialism, um, corruption, all the things which um, you read on the news every day. And we just feel it's unfair. We feel that the, the data and the voting sort of um, movement clearly shows what the Western Cape population would like. And it's just not happening. We keep on getting what we're not voting for. Yeah, I mean, you say it in a very polite, sophisticated way. I bluntly say the ANC are kleptocrats and ineptocrats. I didn't make those words up. And, you know, couldn't run a, a, a pub brawl in a, in a, bro, in a <laughs> no, that's the other one, in a, in a bar. Phil, I know what you were thinking. And Phil, what is the process for a referendum and is it achievable? But yes, it, yes, it is achievable. Um, look, the, the process isn't it isn't a simple process. It's kind of it's kind of a, a process of, of, of escalating levels, I guess. So, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental thing is that, that we that we need to have support. Uh, we need to 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 have 50 percent plus one, not necessarily to get the referendum, but to, to win the referendum. But I think in all intents and purposes, uh, we're not going to get a referendum unless we can indicate that there is uh, there is a reasonable prospect of winning and of course we wouldn't want to call a referendum until we were fairly sure that we uh, that we were going to win anyway um 
So the, so the process in the first instance is the Premier of the Western Cape uh, has, the, has the power. He's the only person who's got the power to call for a referendum. So at this point, it's Alan Windy. And, and clearly, we'd love to, uh, to have Alan Windy call for a referendum in this election cycle, whilst, uh, whilst the, the DA have got 55% of the, of the vote. And, and, and therefore, they don't need to have anybody else's permission to, to, to call for a referendum. Um, Clearly, that would then require the uh, the, the South African government uh, assenting to a referendum. So, you know, in an ideal world, we would we would be able to negotiate a referendum. Uh, but if we got to a point where we had good grounds to call for a referendum, and we did call for a referendum, but it wasn't granted, that would just simply then move on to the next level of escalation, which would then start to do, to, uh, to to come under the principles of international law, uh, because fundamentally, the the peoples of the Cape. Uh, look, the Cape is 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 a, is a territory that's that, that, according to international law, is capable of being a sovereign state, and uh, the peop the population of the Western Cape, the six million of us, qualify under international law as a peoples. So, therefore, regardless of what South African law says, regardless of the South African constitution, and uh, we have we have the right to self determination. We have the right to to our own uh, choice uh, political choices. Uh, we uh, have a right to to preserve our own culture and our own economic well being, um, and all of those. Are, are rights enshrined in international law, uh, which, 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 um, you know, and are correct me, or, you know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the uh, ANC government supported... The ANC government supported South Sudan's secession from Sudan. Uh, correct. The ANC government has supported all international claims for uh, secession. Am I right? So, look, I, I don't know which ones they have and they haven't supported, but they're signatories to the United Nations, which has the right of self-determination into there. They're signatories to the African Union, which has the right to self-determination. But, but beyond that, uh, we also have to, to, to understand that, 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 that whilst it would be a far smoother process if we had South Africa's permission, ultimately we don't need South Africa's permission. You know, most examples of secession uh, are, are, are concluded without the permission of the parent state rather than, than with it. So, so ultimately it, it won't come down. If, if South Africa don't uh, accede to secession, it won't come down to South Africa or actually, ironically, the Western Cape either. Um, it will come down to the international community. And, and it comes down to one, once you've declared yourself independence, uh, independent, uh, do you receive recognition? So, so does the UK, does the US, does the Netherlands, does Israel, uh, uh, you know, the other EU countries, other African countries, do they come and recognize us as an independent state? And if we get de facto recognition, then we are a state. And, and if we fail to get de facto recognition, then, then we aren't a state. So, you know, in that regard, you know, there's a degree of international high stakes poker. Um, but clearly, we'd have all of those things lined up in advance. So we, so we would know that we had support before we called for the referendum. So we're going to do a poll. We're going to go for a referendum. We're going to get Alan Wendy to actually comment and say, at some point, let's go. Sure. And then we go for the referendum. We need 51%. I want to ask a question on who gets to vote in that, but we'll come back to that. Uh, we win, we get 51%, then goes to the Netherlands, the, I don't know where the court is, I presume in the Netherlands. And do they vote then? Because, you know, the ANC are pretty good at brown paper bags, you know. Uh, is it 51% of all the countries or is there a court of 13 wise people, hopefully all New Zealanders? Uh, no, it, you you would think it was you would think it was that organised. It's actually uh, hugely less organised than that. So there isn't a vote, there isn't a court. That there is just so so effectively. Uh, let, let's say the DA are on board. They ask for the referendum. The ANC say no, you can't have the referendum. The 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 the. the um, government of the Western Cape says, so well, fine, it's okay, we are now declaring ourselves independent. Then we, then the UK then comes along and says, great, we, we recognize the, the, the uh, sovereign state of good hope, the, the Cape of good hope as a country, and, and now it's a country. And the US comes along and says, well, we recognize it as a country. And as soon as you have recognition, then, then you exist. Um, and we often use two examples of that that, that help people see that. So, so Bangladesh, um, seceded from Pakistan by declaring itself independent. So Pakistan didn't want Bangladesh to go. In fact, it did everything it could to stop Bangladesh going. But Bangladesh declared itself independent. India recognized Bangladesh as an independent country, and therefore it became an independent country. At, at broadly the same time of history, uh, Biafra declared itself independent from Nigeria. Um, nobody recognized Biafra. So, so, so today, Bangladesh is a separate country. Biafra isn't. 
Um, but I mean, so in terms of recognition, it would just depend on on, on what other countries did, and th and that depends upon the strength of your of your, of your argument. And ours would be quite compelling. Yeah, I'm sorry you raised the buyer, for example, because didn't Nigeria then try and starve them and blitz them to death? <laughs> anyway, we won't get onto that. Um, so interesting. In the back of my mind, there's a question here from no name, but. Uh, you know, let's say Biden does get elected. You know, the Democrats have been such wussies around the world. One wonders whether they'd even support us. That's rather worrying. Um, so let's talk about who who can vote. Joe, do you want to go tell us how one? Uh, yeah. So it's um, this is very much focused on what's best for the citizens of the Western Cape. So. Um, the referendum would be called saying all the registered voters in the Western Cape can, can participate. And um, yeah, we're obviously hoping the majority of them agree with us. So how many registered voters today? I think it's in the order of 3.2, full of the right number, million. That many? 3.2 million. Um, okay, that's yeah. healthy. And if we had a referendum two years time, in this investment uh, election cycle, two, three years time, let's assume we get it in within the cycle, would it only be people who registered to vote in the prior election that are allowed to vote? That'll be the best outcome because I think it sort of protects against people manipulating, um, busting people in, etc. So there are concerns about how fair things will be. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we, we haven't actually worked out these kind of details. Like we're very much focused on calling for the referendum and winning the referendum. So we'll we'll progress to the point of of of, of seeing exactly how it unfolds. There is a there there is a, there's a, there's an act, the referendum act, which defines all these kind of things. So we'll have to just follow the the exact sort of letter of the law in terms of how a referendum is um, is established. Look, I think this is just an idea that's come to me, and people who know me know that it's a free will is we should try and encourage the ANC to get rid of us. You know, so yeah, ironically, like, that's, that's kind of the, the, that was the sort of like the Singapore story. So uh, there were these sort of like two groups, they couldn't get along. Um, at some point, they just said, okay, let's just get out of each other's hair. I mean, that'd be like the absolute first prize. <laughs> yeah, Dino Peros asks the question I was going to ask last of all, who keeps the spring box? But I guess we spin a coin. What Do you have an answer to that? I think if 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 you create if you create the right environment, um, you will attract um, sort of the right individuals. So uh, I'm pretty sure. Fast forward by five years, we'll we'll probably have a winning rugby team. Yeah, and the ANC one didn't never like the Springboks, did they? So <laughs> realistically, um, let's talk economy. Um, you know, outside of the Western, the Western Cape is an agricultural powerhouse in South African. And, and now that uh, I mean, Gagwa's destroyed the rest of Zimbabwe, in African terms, it's still a powerhouse with export quality. But what else do we have? I know the answer. I'm just testing you guys. Yeah, so I'd say financial services, um, definitely sort of um, tech entrepreneurship, tech, tech economy. Um, I think the sort of strongholds around that is probably like UCT, Stellenbosch, and also innovations generated there. So like, um, I believe it'll have to be some kind of um, technology-driven, services-driven economy. With agriculture, yes, and tourism is obviously like I think tourism, the yeah, and great wine. people works in tourism in the Western Cape, so tourism is, is a massive one. And let me chip in. I know, Phil. I want to take what I know you're about to say is if you have a look at countries like Israel, which has nothing. It's a, basically a desert. Was a desert. Rwanda, a lot of hills with some tin. You know, there and Switzerland. You know, a bunch of very cold mountains with good skiing. You know, those are countries that have built their incredible powerhouses, economic powers on human capital. So you don't have to have oil gushing out of the ground uh, or even mines to have a successful country. I think, you know, given the right economic and dem democratic and capitalist base and allow human ingenuity to step up, you know, we can do anything. Was that what you were going to say, Chris? Phil, sorry. Well, yeah, I think. Look, so, so I think I think the the, the stats are interesting because because there are there are a whole lot of myths around Cape independence. A lot a lot of people are quite wary of debating the merits of what's best for the Cape people because obviously what's best for the Cape people it clearly isn't to be part of South Africa at this point in time. So so we spin off into all of these little side issues that people dash down. Um, but what tends to happen then is then they don't have their facts straight. So one of the one of the ironies with the, with the Western Cape economy and interesting enough, Darby Root confirmed this in an interview at the weekend. Um, uh, is that the Western Cape economy is, is a significant net contributor 
to uh, to the South African fiscus. Uh, so so you know even though we are we obviously are, are competing with one hand tied behind our back, and clearly we're not operating at, at optimum performance given that we're, that we're under the sort of ANC rules, and we we still are a massive net net. Uh, 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 subsidizer of South Africa. So, so the day that we become independent, we become 38% better off overnight if nothing else changes. And uh, the Western Cape economy is already the size of Botswana and uh, the Namibia and Zimbabwe combined. So, we've, so we've, we've got an economy the size of three countries. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and currently, uh, we, we, we give, uh, look, our GDP is, is Western Cape produces 13.9% of the GDP of South Africa. And we've got 15.4% of the personal tax payers in, in the Western Cape. Uh, we've only got 11.2% of the population. And uh, we receive 10.1% of the, of the government's financial, financial allocation. So assuming nothing other than, than as, as a sort of a, a rough calculation, we're being 13.9% GDP in, and we're getting 10.1% back out. If we stop paying the 13.9% to South Africa, and we stop receiving the 10.1% back, we would we would already be infinitely better off. And there's only two there's only two provinces that do that: Gauteng and the Western Cape are the only two uh, two two net positive uh, provinces in South Africa. And do you know what the quantum is? The 10.1 to the what is the amount? Because I know somebody said, I'll, I'll, look, I'll look her message to me yeah. up. It's, it's 51 billion US a year. Okay. So I'm going to just give her initials, BS. Oh, actually, you know what I'm talking about. There's the number, because I think you mentioned a number that would be the deficit that if we left the rest of South Africa, but this way more than covers it. Um, some a couple of my friends actually only two of them so it is a couple have said you know it's quite a racist thing cape independence and i'm like what the hell and this is you know everything these days is racist these lefties are bonkers and out of control but i mean what are they talking about i don't even get that look there are there are look in any movement you know broadly speaking we are talking about uh, joe is quite right 3.3.1 .3 million is the, is is the uh, is is the voter base of the western cape if we want 50 percent plus one then we need uh, uh, 1.55 million plus one um so which would be a straight majority so yeah you know, if you have 1.55 million people you're going to have you're going to have a real cross spread of opinions and you can imagine that when Cape Independence was first spoken about, you know, most people, when things were going fairly well, it was kind of a quite a radical idea that certainly didn't attract the mainstream. So, you know, first on board were the rabid racists and 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 the you know the the, the, the imbeciles uh, who 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 uh, were were dreaming of uh, you know of, of apartheid version two. Um, but I mean, they're a tiny, tiny minority, and they're certainly not in our group uh, anything but. Um, but they're not really in many other people's groups either. So, so, so I would lie if I said there, you know, there isn't going to be a, a racist fringe. Uh, we, we do everything we possibly can to disassociate with themselves. And as an organisation, we are absolutely fervently anti-racist. In fact, um, Progress SA ran a poll uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, trying to establish people's motives, and, and that was one of the accusations they were polling for. You know, is this kind of a, a nationalistic? racially motivated thing and actually whilst they weren't advocates of independence so actually they polled as 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 as, as skeptics of independence they themselves declared that they were happy to announce that subject at the end at the end of their polling that the main justifications for people who wanting cape independence were economic freedom non-racialism um, uh, uh, prosperity uh, and 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 genuine democracy. So you know this is this is the liberal centre that are pushing for this. And, and whilst there are idiots at the extreme, they are not the they are not the movement. And actually, at the in, you know, the interesting thing is we are at an exciting time in the movement now in that it's going mainstream. People who haven't been talking about it suddenly are. It's in the newspapers. The economists are talking about it. Major politicians are talking about it. And, and now we're getting into that moderate middle. Who are the people ultimately that will uh, that will carry uh, that will will, will carry uh, ind independence? Yeah, and I so think the, what happened in oh, sorry. So the people in Constantia Bishop's Court are waking up at last. You know, <laughs> long sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I've just, just I just pissed off most of my friends, but. Um, on a serious note, there are a number of groups campaigning for Cape Exit, the Cape Party. Um, can you, Joe, maybe you can tell us who are they, how they differ. And then, you know, I don't know if you guys watched Game of Thrones. Everyone has their favorite character. Joe, did you watch it? It's looking convincing. Did you? Uh, parts of it. I'm not a big series watcher. It sucks up too much time. Oh, oh, you, you but anyway, for the people on the show, 
Game of Thrones, everyone has their favorite character. And I know you guys think that I think I'm the guy who lost his arm, the good looking one, the bad guy turned good guy. No, I'm Mance Raider because there's the wall. He was the knight of the wall and he had crossed the wall and he unites the, you know, the dragons and the giants and the, all the, you know, all the people on the other side of the wall. And I do think that's my job here is to unite you guys. And then, you know, the natural leader will come out of it all. So Joe, who are the other groups? What do they stand for? Can we bang all our heads together? Yeah, so uh, I guess the first question is, um, is it good or bad that there are multiple groups? And so there are probably at least six groups that are active at the moment. Um, some of them, are, there, be, there have been some other groups, some of them are dormant, some of them got a bit disorganized, but there, let's say there are sort of actually seven major groups at the moment. Um, we're the new kids on the block. We've only been around for sort of about seven weeks since we launched our website. Um, and we are the only one that's specifically a political lobby group. Um, let me just bring up the sort of blog post on our site, which, which we talk about these things. The other one, which you obviously would have heard about is Cape Exit and they're growing quite rapidly. So it gets into that quite interesting nuances as to how the groups differ, but it's basically all about the process they aim to follow to bring us to the referendum and secession. And so a lot of the groups are focused on international law and they will use things like um, cultural identity, language identity. Um, some of them, some of them will try to use race, but obviously we try and steer away from anything that in that sort of um, uh, call it sort of sphere. Um, but the major ones are just opening up the list here. So uh, we're the political lobby group. The K Party is a political party. Uh, the Freedom Front is also a political party. But I think they only recently really started supporting secession. They were sort of pro uh, some kind of federal system for quite a while. And then the Cape Colored Congress, uh, Cape Exit I mentioned, and the ULA is the United Liberty Alliance, and then the Sovereign State of Good Hope which is a kind of Khoisan group also following international law, but they have the idea that they want to establish um, first nation status in the sort of in the, in the minds of the UN. So it's quite a list. Uh, best to just visit our webpage and go, go read the article. It goes into the, the detail of, of all the various groups and the nuances of their, their strategy. But let me just jump back to the previous question. Is it a bad thing that there are multiple groups? In my opinion, no, because each of these groups uh, are following a different strategy. We, we're not clear as to what's going to be the winning one. We obviously think we uh, we have a good one. And a lot of these groups have different, um, what is sort of a Venn diagram of support. So some people, whatever your language background, et cetera, will make you gravitate to a message in, in one of these environments. And we just say to people, um, support all the groups or support the ones you feel most comfortable supporting. Can't we support them all? Yeah, I, I kind of, I, so we, we the, the ones we list on our website are the one which have committed to sort of non-racial thinking. That's kind of, that's a primary principle for us. And so anyone on this list um, gets our nod. Okay. So Phil, do you think we can combine? I mean, if more and more groups are recognizing the referendum is probably the only way to go. Um, can we get there? Can we bang everyone together? We don't have a lot of time. Yeah, we're, we're never going to get um, we're, we're never going to get everybody exactly to the same point. And I think probably that's fine. Now, fundamentally, if you're a political party uh, or for us a political lobby group, you've got different aims. So the Cape Party want to want to get seats in Parliament. Uh, we primarily want to focus the position of the, of, of the DA on this because they've already got seats in Parliament. So so clearly we're going to have different interests that will never directly align. But what we can do is cooperate, and we do, um, and we all belong to an organisation called the Cape Independence Forum, um, and we and we 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 meet there. We all know each other in terms of the leaders, and we and we uh, collaborate as as much as we can, and uh, we try and find uh, find common ground. So so on a, any particular campaign, you know, we're about to launch a, a a car sock campaign where we'll have a a Cape flag that people start putting on their cars. So for argument's sake, some of the groups will, will, will join in that campaign and run it alongside of us. Other groups won't do it. So uh, look, we obviously a lot of people, it's probably our most asked question is, can you all combine? The differences under, ultimately are, are just too great 
for us all to combine into one group, but we can, but we can, can increasingly cooperate. And one of our primary functions when we came into the space was to uh, to make that happen. And we've been one of the big drivers of this move of pulling the groups together to at least talk and to communicate and to uh, and to cooperate. And even if we disagree about something, to not undermine each other or criticize each other in public, so that we so that we so that we at least all move towards the same space. I think it's important that this happens now. And and if you know people on these other groups are listening, let's get together. You know, I'm happy to host it social distancing, even on a Zoom call. I'm happy to host this and try and pull everyone together. You know, I am a DA voter and a fan of the DA and a supporter of the DA and a believer in the DA. But separately, I'm a big fan of uh, Herman Mashabas and of Musi Maimani's. And I like Patricia DeLille. And, you know, you can have, in the old days before the lefties went mad, you could have, you know, opinions. And on 10 issues, if you agree on seven and a half, you're there. You know, you can compromise as long as the major seven and a half issues are agreed upon. And from what I'm hearing, the main four for us, for Cape Independence, you're going to have to help me on this. One, economic freedom. Was that the word? I've got one out of four. Two, non-racialism. What are the other two? I've gotten... Where were the other economic two? Economic freedom, non-racialism, democracy, and, 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 and uh, prosperity. <laughs> Okay, because economic freedom and prosperity are very much linked, but I guess all four are linked. Um, the DA, let's talk about the DA. Come on, Alan, you've got to be listening to this. Um, I know you've got this policy of keeping quiet, and, and there must be a, a sensible reason for that. And I'm sure there is. I mean, you're sensible guys. But Phil, what is the reason for them to keep quiet? Are they hoping to see which winner will emerge? Are they praying that we're successful so they don't have to do the work? Are they holding the front for us while we work away all positive things and i admire them for it but it, look it, it's 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 a bowl it, it, it's a difficult it's a bit of a conundrum for them to be honest so so i understand to a certain extent what, what you know that, that i believe look obviously we don't know exactly why they're not we do know that they're heavily split in the western cape so we talk to you know we've got sources inside the da we do talk to people in the da and the da in the western cape is heavily split um over this issue and the DA itself is split between those in the Western Cape and those outside of the Western Cape. So clearly, if you're a DA voter in, in the rest of South Africa, Cape independence will be much less attractive than if you're a DA voter in the Western Cape. And once the DA uh, declares its hand on this, uh, there's going to be implications. And I think if they support it, there are going to be implications in one way. And if and if they don't support it, there are, there are going to be implications in the other. So, so. Uh, yeah, I think at this point in time, that, that you know, if the, for as long as they're allowed to say nothing about this, they will. Uh, which is which is which is really where our core strategy comes in. Yeah, we've set about making sure they're not allowed to to, to say nothing. We've already drawn John Steenhazen into comment, and we've already drawn several MPs into comment. But we we have got uh, MPs who are willing to take this forward in the party. We know that that senior members of the of the DA leadership uh, are behind independence privately. They haven't yet declared their hand. Um, but that time is coming, and I guess we're trying to uh, do everything we can to hasten that and to to you know, and, and in terms of there, we we have got multiple. I can't clearly can't talk about them now, but we have got multiple irons in that fire. And although we're we're an organisation that's seven or eight weeks old, uh, don't don't let that not think that we haven't got our tentacles into uh, pretty well every major political party in the Western Cape. Uh, yet we have got people who will be will be raising for us in Parliament. Uh, yeah, we've we've got people in the press. So so you know the DA is going to comment on this. It, you know we we went when we first started. Uh, you know we said we're going to make the DA comment. It took us about three weeks before we drew uh, we drew the DA into public comment, and 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 that's going on and on and on. And you know they're going to come out of this. And ultimately, what's going to happen is the DA in the Western Cape will get behind this the DA in the rest of the country won't get behind this and they'll have to sort that mess out amongst themselves unfortunately because the, the bottom line is that the DA in the Western Cape look I wrote in one of our newspaper articles you know that the, the DA in, in South Africa is trying to bluff elect, electorate with a pair of sevens that somehow this sort of that realignment of politics and coalition government is the future which I don't think anybody really believes it especially after what we've seen in Nelson Mandela Bay and in, in, in Joburg and Toria yeah, so that hasn't worked out so well where the DA in the Western Cape is sitting with a royal flush, you know, they've got 55% of 
vote. They're in the third straight term as government. We, we don't need anything to change. We, 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 just, need to, we just need to make the arrangement permanent uh, so that the people of the Western Cape choose their own government rather than having it chosen for them. And, and the DA in the Western Cape gets to enact its own policies rather than having to enact the ANC's policies. So, you know, for, 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 unless, you've, unless you've got some other uh, motivations, then, then the DA in the Western Cape would absolutely be the biggest the biggest winners out of that and obviously there's a whole load of the amps that recognize that entirely uh, and there'll come a point in time where if they are forced you know if the western cape gets behind independence and the da realize either we get behind this or the electorate is going to get behind somebody else that does get behind this then it's game over and that's and that's the situation we're pushing so joe i'm going to ask you in a second uh, to tell us what we want what do you want i mean we need to put money behind this organization we need you and Phil to co-opt me to bang everyone's heads together so we're working, at least the majority of the groups are working in the right direction. Uh, we need the DA, and I will help you here, you know, at least say how we can work in parallel with them for the good of the Western Cape and the good of all DA voters in, in South Africa. Um, what do you need? Money? Give me the sources and uses of funds. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for hosting the, um, the Smart B Group. Um, you guys have been instrumental in sort of our, call it bootstrapping funding. There's so we now have the money, we now have the money to do our first poll, which is uh, a big part of our strategy. Um, I'd say, yeah, the obvious one is money. And uh, we do have a funding doc, which sort of describes our ideas for how that money is going to get used and the sort of roadmap. There are currently four phases described in the document. It all goes back to uh, campaigning, visibility, and then getting the appropriate data and polling uh, in a couple of, call it sort of every two, three months to see that the campaigning is successful. Um, there's a PR component. So we're also looking for people to help with getting our message into mainstream media. We've had a, a couple of people rock up on our door and, and, and offer for that, uh, offer to help. But it's, it's, quite an open, um, it's quite an open invitation. So uh, we've had some suggestions from people that say they want to come uh, contribute to putting up billboards, for example. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 an open scope. If people can get creative as to how they can uh, contribute, but money is the obvious one. Come to the smart piece. We're talking about you know that poster out to the airport, that billboard, buying it for two years and just saying <laughs> into Cape Independence. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> my, perfect. Yeah, well, there, exactly. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, so okay, so let's get some questions from the uh, from the blog here um, because there's some great people on here and they ask Olivia Vaughan who um, is a, is quite fiery and terrific she says can we roll this out in other areas how do we you know we def the Western Cape boundary is fairly well defined but you know who, what if uh, Graf Renet wants to come and join us and uh, those beautiful Karoo farms which are 100 kilometers out how does that happen how do boundaries get defined Phil uh, so look so the, the, the boundaries were starting with the Western Cape for a good reason. So uh, un, under uh, under international law, one of the requirements is a defined boundary. And uh, the people of the Western Cape, the territory of the Western Cape, the Western Cape government is already defined. And we've got a record of their ideology, ideological beliefs because they're on record as, as the results from the, from, from the general election since 1994. So that's our starting point. But you're quite right that, that if you look at the, uh, the electoral map, the areas to the south of the Northern Cape and the areas to the west of the Eastern Cape are all uh, east, are all predominantly DA voters. So we'd have to find the exact mechanism for that, whether it was part of the initial referendum or whether it was, was something that, that followed shortly afterwards. But, but you know, we fundamentally are committed to democracy. So therefore, we want, we want the border to ultimately define by what people want. So, so once we have the initial border in place of the Western Cape, then our view is that at municipal level, um, municipalities would be able uh, along the border would be able to either opt in or opt out so there, there may be uh, you know there are some ANC territories and municipalities in the Western Cape perhaps they would rather remain in South Africa and um, and obviously an awful lot of, of, of the municipalities on, on the outside of the border but adjacent to it so I think over a period of time 
that could democratically be 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 things. And those that want to be in the in the new country will be in the new country, and those that want to be in South Africa can be in South Africa, as long as obviously there's a continuous territory. Clearly, you know the the you know, Bay can't decide it wants to be in South Africa, or the rest of Cape wants to be, the rest of the Western Cape wants to be. Uh, to, 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 to be in the new country and so there'll be practicalities involved but but so far as practically possible yes and, and we ultimately the country being a little bit bigger than the western cape because we think you know it, it's highly likely that territories along the border would much rather be in uh, in the cape of good hope than uh, than in let's call it azania or what or south africa or whatever we're going to call the, the remainder after we've left and so there's some questions here on violence you know like war and borders and violence i mean are those days over or should we be worried or you know i don't think so look so so people have different views so unfortunately it's difficult to to sort the sort of the the yeah you know, the wheat from the chaff because uh, because people that are opposed to independence very rarely attack it on its merits because how would you make an argument that people of the western cape are better off in in, in south africa being ruled by the anc so what happens is they 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 tend to, uh, to to come with 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 other arguments and people love to have you know we, we know that south africa loves every form of khafar uh, so uh, so that so we now kind of have secession khafar that, that that somehow if we if we if we express our democratic will uh, that, uh, that the army is going to come down and interestingly enough to be fair to the ANC, they haven't made a single noise at this point in time that's even remotely threatening. The, the, Cape, the Cape Party's been around for 13 years. It's registered with the, uh, the IEC. The National Prosecuting Authority declared in 2010 that secession was a, a political and not a criminal matter. Um, so, so at this point, there's been no indications of violence. Uh, we are completely committed to, uh, to, to, to peaceful means, as are all of the independence groups. Um, so I don't think, yeah, for my view, I don't. I really don't see this being being violent. But you know, we had this question last night in a, in, a, in a blog that we did. And if we look at the worst case scenario, and let's say that the, the ANC decide that they that they kind of want to hold on to the Cape by military force, we're certainly not going to start a civil war off it back. At that point, we'll just we'll just we'll just follow Gandhi and we'll have peaceful resistance. You know, and the, and the day that the that the ANC has to hold the Western Cape. Uh, and impose what would be minority rule by military force, it, then South Africa's already broken down. Yeah, it may True. take uh, months or a period of time for the international community through sanctions to to, to sort that mess out. Um, and uh, but I don't see it being a civil war because we we have no no interest in a war at all. We could we could just let time work on our side. And ultimately, I don't believe that ANC will do that anyway because I think whatever their faults are, they're, they're so linked in. You know, their heritage is so so tied into you know. Uh, uh, fighting against minority rule and fighting for democracy that uh, that, that then to, to throw all of that in the water and, and roll tanks in to stop people having a democratic will just seems a stretch too far even for them but, but yeah i mean everyone knows me well knows i rant and rave against the anc and call them kleptocrats and ineptocrats which i fundamentally believe they are but i do actually believe the majority at the top believe in the rule of law believe in democracy and even though they most of those nutcases are socialists. I, you know, you've got to have economic growth, and even the stupidest of people who who support socialism, you've got to be stupid to support socialism. Even they know you've got to keep capitalists, you know, entrepreneurs and human ingenuity going to have any economic growth. Socialism is just driving countries down the sink. Even they know that. So let's get another question. Uh, I know Nick French is dying to join here. Um, have you seen a question here? Uh, financial, I mean, my question is, you know, do they pay us to go, which would probably be the most sensible thing. You know, we're just a nuisance, Frankie. Are they going to have the mines, sadly, because I don't have an investment there anymore. My mining friends wouldn't agree. Um, what are the questions? Um, I suppose the issues like currency and the spring box and things are issues that have to be dealt with. Not, not easy. The emotional ones are the hardest. Uh, migration policies, passports, I mean, that all comes after the fact. Um, and I think people were a little bit worried about when they looked at Brexit, what an unbelievably difficult process that was. I voted Brexit. Um, you know, you want this to be right, guys, you voted go. But it never is that easy, is it? 
No, look, th th there's going to be a huge amount amount of political negotiation after the fact. So one, once we've got that, and that's what you know, and I think from from you know, coming back to your earlier question, from what's going to be the the, the referendum? How's the question going to be phased? Uh, yeah, how do we comprise the electorate? Who checks that there's no shenanigans going on at the IEC? You know. Mm -hmm. How, how do we split up our financial affairs? You know, w w you know, how much of the national debt do we take? Uh, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, all of that is going to be one giant political negotiation. But it all it all starts with what's the democratic will of the people? Either we, either we want to get divorced from South Africa or we want to remain married to South Africa. And you know, and I often say to people, you don't start off with 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 the, with the divorce saying who gets the car, and if I get the car, I'll decide whether whether I want to get divorced or not. You decide whether you want to get divorced or not, and then after that, you work out how you're going to split the assets, and you and you hopefully do that amicably. And if you can't do it amicably, then you then then you have to refer to to sort of third parties and arbitration, and it'll be exactly the same for us. You know, we we hopefully will be able to to, to negotiate everything. If we can't, and the international community is forced to come in and negotiate on our behalf, then then so be it. And if they are, that's probably a good thing. So, Joe, um, how can we help? How much money do you need to get to the next step? Smut, he's got behind you and giving you the money for a poll. Uh, and that poll is going to ask what question? Do you want a referendum? Uh, polling turns out is quite a science and uh, quite a tactical thing. So we have an international um, political whiz that's advising us on the questions because you, you're you going to get some data, but you also want to collect some Call it sort of PR questions, sort of things you can use to gain momentum in the, in the media. So that's underway. We're busy designing it. We've got uh, the funding and we've got the quotes and um, we've got the repeat, repeatable um, polling entities. So that, that's that's happening. But we'll probably have to do a couple of these. So in the pipeline, we'll, we think it's probably three, might be more. Uh, these things go for around 180 to 240,000 rand a poll. Um, so it's not cheap. Uh, and how many people do you poll? How many people is a credible poll? That will give you a thousand sample size. And you spread it across the Western Cape. So you do Crawford Beaufort West, blah, blah, blah. Actually, not Crawford Net, Beaufort West, blah, blah. Yeah, if, once you start digging into the, the process, you also realize it's quite a um, painful process. You have to randomize a bunch of phone numbers, start phoning. You might phone people which are not in the Western Cape. You put it on the phone, you phone again. So it's quite a lot of phoning to get to a so thousand sample When will this take place, Joe? We are hoping to kick it off towards the end of this month. Um, and then it'll probably be a two week process for us to get the data back. And then we'll do some analysis on the data. We'll probably release that um, within a sort of week or two after we get the data. So that's that funded. Then you need to raise how much for what is the next step? Yeah, so then the rest of the stuff probably falls under the banner of visibility. So it's the uh, car stock campaigns, the magnets, the stickers, the flags, the t-shirts. There's a whole merchandising e-commerce project that kicked off this week. And we're hoping to start selling the first items at the end of July. Um, and then there's there's a, a lot of awareness, uh, bigger um, marketing campaigns. So there'll be things like billboards, um, quite a big and strategic targeted uh, digital marketing and social media campaigns. Um, and then we can also sort of start seeing uh, probably uh, bringing some PR people on board that are just uh, strategists in terms of, of media, um, media tactics. Okay, I know some good ones. And then um, when do we pull the trigger? Like we assume that we will get the vote, then we will we pull the trigger on pushing for the referendum? Is that Q2, Q3, Q4? Actually, we're in Q2. Uh, it's, it's hard to look into the crystal ball. Uh, the, the timeline which our group is sort of set internally is a, roughly a two-year process. So if we're lucky, the right polling data comes back, let's say, early next year, which put, makes us confident in um, in calling for a referendum. Then it's a, probably going to be three to six months of intense debate in the country um, a lot of a lot of campaigning to be done. Uh, I think everybody that votes needs to be fully aware of their decision. So there's going to be a, a big part of that. And then, if we're lucky, yeah, somewhere in the in the next two years, we we get the referendum, we win the referendum. Got it. And how much is the total amount of money we need to raise between now and independence? Do we know? 
So we just kind of taken a bit of a sort of a step function approach. So we, 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 we phase the thing. We also, if people contribute, we do want to show them that we're using the money sensibly. So we, we're quite transparent about the projects we kick off and the targets and the sort of aims we, we have for those, for those projects. And so the first document, which has gone out, talks about 650,000 Rand. And so from there, depending on success, uh, depending on the learnings, depending on sort of what comes back, um, I can see us kicking off some targeted social media, some billboards. It's, it could become quite expensive. Um, if we're successful in raising the right kind of money, I could see it growing to a budget of probably half a million rand per month. Got it. Phil, final comments? What do we need Sorry. to do? What do we need to do? We, we, raise money? What else? Look, I, I, the, the money the, the money is just a facilitation. We, we we need to peddle influence. That's actually what we need to do. We need we need to get fifty percent plus one on board. And the key to that, there are two things. One is one is controlling the media so that we that we that we are are getting uh, getting this subject out into all of the media sources. We're getting onto to, to TV. We're getting it onto uh, into the newspapers. Look, we've been very successful with that so far, but we but we haven't yet broken into yeah. You know, there's some more left wing titles. So News 24 have been very obstinate, particularly that, that they last ran an article in, on independence in 2016, and and and, and so we, so we're trying to, do, to 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 get into those things. So if people have got any way of helping us to get into some of the of the titles we can't get into, uh, that would definitely help. Um, and then people, look, obviously, and particularly people who are, are relatively wealthy, all have got connections in the DA. So any connection you've got in the DA or connection of a connection in the DA, that is the fundamental thing to this year. So, so you know, we, we'll use money to try and make that happen. But if you if you know an MP or you know a minister or you know somebody or even a local councillor, we have to make the DA support. And, and to put this into context, I have got, in our context, I have got a DA MP who says, I will stand up and I will advocate publicly inside the party and outside of the party for Cape Independence. But the timing has to be right for me. So, okay. so um, we need to do that. And, and in this group of people, I'm sure that you have all got tentacles that connect with the DA. And if every every one person starts to send those messages down the line that listen, this isn't something that is that is a bunch of of of, of right wing lunatics. This is us. This well, is the business people. Yeah. This is the movers and shakers of of the Western Cape. We want Cape Independence, and we want you to start talking about it, and we want you to come out and, and talk to us. And if, and if you're against it, then 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 come and tell us why you're against it, and and and, and engage with us. Yeah. So that so that's you know, that's that that's the key thing for us. So the DA that I love and support, we're coming for you. We need you. We need your help. Phil and Joe, thank you very much. S Group and Smutby, let's get behind this with money. Let's get behind it with intelligence, with contacts. Let's get Hollywood behind us. Let's get the international community behind us, and let's get the ANC to want to get rid of us. I think that's the answer. So Joe, Phil, thank you. Thanks everyone. Cape Independence. Speak soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.